I'm a Deschutes Public Library, and this program, The Impact of Banned Books in Central Oregon, is put on as part of Deschutes Public Library's virtual programming, and, of course, in celebration of Banned Books Week. Thank you to all of our panelists for being here tonight, and thank you to all of you for being here. We gather here with respect and curiosity as a community, and this would not be possible without our wonderful, curious Central Oregon community. All right, I'm going to introduce our panelists for the night. We have Pia Allende, Redmond School District Librarian. Pia served as a co-chair of the Oregon Library Association EDIA Anti-Racist Committee during the fiscal year of 2021-22, and as a member of the Redmond School District Equity Committee since September of 2020. She was one of three 2022 School Library Journal School Librarian of the Year finalists. Her favorite book, her favorite, pardon me, band book is 1984 by George Orwell. Emily O'Neill is the Technical Services Manager at Deschutes Public Library. She has been a member of the Oregon Intellectual Freedom Committee since October 2020 and began serving as co-chair for the OIFC starting with the fiscal year of 2021-22. Her favorite band book is Harry Potter. April Wittavine is the director of Crick County Library and a former Deschutes Public Librarian. April has joined in Oregon, has worked in Oregon libraries since 2005. She loves making community connections and challenging any and all stereotypes about modern librarianship. Her favorite band book is Ashley Hope Perez's Out of Darkness. She, at April, served on the American Library Association's Michael L. Prince Award Committee that gave out of Darkness, the, um, the Honor Medal. So panelists, thank you so much for joining me tonight for this discussion on banned and challenged books. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Right. So we just witnessed a video in which Emily O'Neill kind of explained to us a little bit about the dictionary definition, the denotation of what intellectual freedom is. But can you tell me, what does intellectual freedom mean to all of you? Sure, I'd be happy to start. Um, hi, everyone, I'm glad you're here. Um, I always tell everyone it's my favorite topic to talk about. So uh, it's a great week to be able to, you know, just spread the word. Um, I always like to start with like the easiest definition that I can come up with, which is really just to re-engineer the term itself. Intellectual freedom reverse engineered is freedom of your own intellect. And so for me, what that means is your freedom to think freely, learn openly. Um, but on a personal level, it's always, I've always been a bit of a divergent thinker. Um, so I just have always really been intrigued about the outside of the box realm. And so it, for me, it means that I am free to investigate new concepts without judgment, learn new and interesting things because it's my right to do so. Um, and I think it's helped me just become the informed person that I am, um, having that right to investigate freely as my scattered brain has sent me down a variety of avenues. When I think Thank about intellectual freedom, oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just thinking about um, my history in librarianship is mainly in youth services. And for a lot of us as adults, when we talk about intellectual freedom, you know, a lot of us are like, well, of course, of course I get to read what I want and investigate what I want. But I think within these conversations, it's really important to remember the rights of everyone to intellectual freedom, regardless of having attained the age of majority or not. Um, I also think about the ability to access information for folks who may be incarcerated or uh, people who are otherwise living in controlled situations and just remembering the fact that this is a right that is given to everyone and it's not dependent on age, status, class, anything like that. And I think that's a really core part of um, what really drives me to think about intellectual freedom. Yeah, for me, I mean, it's all of what you have 
I would say it. And also, in a personal level, is it's the same thing. I mean, I'm always have been uh, seeking different point of view, different perspective. I mean, I have a master in history, so I always uh, work from the point of view of others and looking for others. And since I was a kid, I wanted not to go to the, one of my aunts told me, oh, you're going to go to the Catholic university where we all are from there, or we are all similar. And I was like, no, I don't want that. I want to go to a place that everybody thinks differently. And in terms of, and also I grew up in a dictatorship where many books were not allowed and I couldn't even read. I mean, at the university, we couldn't read Marx, even though I applaud the person that can read the capital. But uh, so for me, it's super important the idea of have access to them. And in, in terms of students, that means also the idea to uh, break down as many barriers as we can in terms of the accessibility to the information and to different uh, perspective and the idea that they can see themselves, that they can see, that they can um, connect with the books in a way that that is not restricted just because somebody told them that they, the teacher told them or the parents told them not to read them. I mean, it's not like, I'm, I'm not saying that they have to go against the, the depends on, against those, I, um, how do you say, their, their teacher or the parents, but there are some information that they should have access without paying a fine, without uh, having them behind the door, unless it's something that, I don't know, is very prone to be stolen or something like that. But in general, or reading levels, for example, don't labeling the, the books because the books, the labeling the book is, is uh, so the kids, they kind of have the tendency of saying, I cannot read more than this. When they, they can read more than that, they, you, we need to amplify that. So. Fantastic, thank you. All right, so Band Books Week is all about celebration of intellectual freedom. And we do that by highlighting books that have been challenged or that have been banned, have been removed entirely from different libraries and different places across the United States. And as Pia pointed out, globally. So tell me about a recent experience that you all have had at your library regarding banned or challenged books. Emily, do you wanna start? Sure. Um... You know, it's been really interesting this year um, and maybe even the last 18 months about, you know, book bans and book challenges is that um, it's been a bit of an onslaught to libraries and especially school libraries with very specific themes and very specific titles in mind. But the other interesting thing is that um, at least here at Deschutes Public Library, we've had more of like informal complaints at, you know, whether it's our service desk or, you know, through social media or web comments. Um, but most of those times, those formal complaints don't follow through with what we consider a formal challenge. So a formal challenge for us requires that the complaint has um, been written down through our request for reconsideration form. And it's not unusual for the public library to get at least a couple of those a year. Um, and actually, ironically, we did not get a single formal complaint last year. So we have had an increase of the informal complaints and concerns, but a reduction in our formal requests for reconsiderations. Um, what I will say is I'm also, as Paige mentioned, the chair of the Oregon Intellectual Freedom Committee, and I am knowing full on that that is not the case at other libraries across the state. I am seeing what is happening to our other libraries, and I think that's one of the reasons why I'm here today is that I feel like if we can continue to talk about what's happening and continue to have the conversation, then maybe we will be at a place where 
our community can be more open to new concepts and they don't move forward with um, the more, you know, formal challenges that the rest of the nation is facing. Uh, similar to Emily, my experiences uh, since I've become the director at Cook County Library have been pretty much the same. Um, maybe uh, one or two requests for reconsiderations come in, but a lot more of the informal conversations. So there is a, a kind of a newfound awareness, I think, of what libraries have been holding and what our collections have, have been. And as libraries strive to serve everyone in our community, communities, um, some of these collections tend to rise up to the surface and attract a little bit of extra attention. So um, topics around sex and sexuality, LGBTQ plus um, titles or characters, um, books that deal with health and human development. These are some of the general topic areas that we'll have conversations with folks about. And a lot of it is um, considering is this something that's appropriate for the age level where it's located in the library. Um, so those always lead to really um, interesting conversations where, you know, we, we get a lot of questions about what we hold in the children's room, for example. Um, and through the sharing of our collection development policy, the philosophy behind our collection development policy and what our professionally trained librarians do to select materials for our library, we can really do a lot of community education around what public libraries have been doing um, kind of since our inception as organizations. Granted, um, the history of public libraries is not squeaky clean, but regardless, um, the conversations do bubble up. We offer the formal um, avenues to do requests for reconsideration. Um, but as Emily said, at in my organization, we had not received many formal challenges. Uh, in my case, I mean, I'm going to speak in a personal level because at, uh, as a district librarian, I only have been there since October of last year. So I have heard things, but they're all kind of things that I, I haven't seen kind of documentation about it, so I cannot say anything. I, I have experienced kind of parents' concern about the book that they don't want their children to read, but, but in general, parents are super nice. I mean, the way they say it is like, I understand that there are many kids, uh, students in, in the school, but in my case of my daughter, I don't want this book, that she reads the book. And actually the daughter, I mean, they had a conversation, which is great. So it's not like me saying, oh, you cannot read the book. It's, it's like, she is like, no, my mom doesn't let me read this book uh, yet. So which that is the way that should be, I guess. So, um, and then in a personal level, I can say that I, I did a bikepacking trip last year and I raised money for the school libraries because all the school libraries are, the average of the libraries, the publication year is 1995. And one of the libraries is 1989, the publication year. So they're older than my own children. My daughter is 26 and my son is 24. So, I mean, some, some parents weren't born with this, with the kids in the school. So, so I decided I'm going to do this. And, and it's not like I raised tons of money. It's, it's, for, it's 2,300 dollars. And I, I researched about like how to donate them. And so I did my, my form and I, and I wanted to buy books that have more representation. I mean, we have 20% of the students that they are Latino and I think around 25% that they are BIPOC. I mean, they, they are mixed race or they, I mean, that is what they declared the data we have. And, um, and even now in my library in Latino <laughs> Heritage Month, I was pulling out all the books that I have of Latino author and I have kind of like three shelves and that's it. So, so it's not too much uh, representation. So I put in the, when I put the donation, I put that I wanted books with a different perspective of a, an author. 
and I and um, and everybody's were like, yeah, no, this is are approved really. And and after the fact, I I was not in the meeting where they submit the all the gift to the district. After that, I started to receive calls and some people, oh, I'm sorry about that. And I was like, about what? <laughs> so, and then I realized that I guess they, they didn't accept my gift unless I provide a list of books. And uh, because they thought, and then I watched the, the, the recording and I realized that maybe they, they don't know me. I mean, they don't, they need to meet me. They need to know that I have three master degrees that I have. I mean, and I, I don't know if I have to prove something. I, I'm a certified librarian and I do my job. I mean, the, and I don't have it. I mean, the thing is that the list of diverse books doesn't exist. I mean, each student has a different, I mean, I can see myself in some books that I'm pretty sure that none of you can see themselves, but you will see other people and you will learn about them. So each person goes through that diversity in a completely different way. So for me, it was more like providing uh, that money to things like, for example, to buy a book that uh, there is a sequel to Amari by a. a. Alston, I think, B.B. Alston, which is a fantasy book that is super nice. Uh, that one student last year was like, I want to see the next one. When is the next one? So it was like, oh, I can have this, this money to buy the sequel. But uh, because a lot of time when you get grants and stuff, you get stuck for that. I mean, you, you have to spend the money at the right time and all the money. In this case, I can just have a little bit here and there when they when they are like, I need to get that book. And it's super nice to have it like, I mean, to hear them and have that book immediately in their hands uh, when, when I, to order it. So so in that sense, it was a little bit of a disappointment. I, 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 I wrote a letter that I read in one of their meetings in June, at the last of June, and I haven't heard from them since. So, so that is my story. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Pia. So going along the same lines, then we, uh, we've already heard a little bit about how items can be reconsidered once they are in the collection. And that is one step in the process for challenging and then formally challenging and then removing a book, which would be a ban. But can you tell me a little bit about the process for how items enter into the collection? Yeah, um, so I would say all libraries should technically have a collection development policy. So, you know, step one, if your library doesn't have a collection development policy, that's a really important policy to have in place, but those policies typically outline the criteria that a library uses to follow for the inclusion of materials into their collection. And so for Deschutes Public Library, as an example, we consider ourselves a popular lending library, which means that we include things of popular and local interest to our community. Um, it also means that we're not an archive, so we're not going to have books that are, you know, dated. We're not going to have run, full runs of an author's works. So we're not going to have every single title that, you know, a popular author might have because that book maybe was popular 20 years ago and we want to stay current and relevant to what is of interest today right now with Deschutes County. So for us, um, our collection development policy has things like relation of interest to the community. Is it going to have lasting value? Uh, we want to pay attention to things like artistic excellence and contemporary significance. So there are certain criteria that uh, materials have to fit for us to include it in our library. And largely, you know, the reason behind that is one, because we do curate, right? We, we want to set a specific uh, tone for the collection that we have. Again, ours is specific to what we think is gonna be demand, in demand for our readers, um, but it also helps narrow the scope. So libraries 
cannot buy every book that is published. Um, I think I saw a statistic once that it's something like 2 million titles are published in an entire year. And maybe some perspective on that, our library buys about 60,000. So we do have to be able to say in some level of objective criteria, what is bought and what is not bought. Um, but our intention is to have it be as, again, objective as possible. And I like your cat. No, no, no good, you know, Zoom meeting can go without a cat. So they're perfect, right on. Um, April, I'll turn it over to you. Sure, I think um, a great part of most public libraries uh, collection development policies is the option for direct patron and customer feedback. Um, so our collection development policy reads pretty similar to what you'll find at Deschutes or other, uh, other libraries, given that we're in a smaller uh, community. We are definitely looking to pay attention to popular lending aspect, um, the representation of our county, not just demographically, but what their what uh, wide variety of interests can be. And then we have our suggestion for purchase process. So this is a way that um, a patron can say, hey, uh, you don't have this book, I think you should have it. And it could be anything from, you know, this 20 year old beginning of the series from my favorite author um, to something that's maybe been on the news recently. And uh, we just haven't gotten a chance to see reviews or, or take a look at that ourselves. So suggestions for purchase is a really great way for library customers to be able to give that feedback. Um, and then those uh, purchase suggestions are measured against the collection development policy, um, just to make sure that they still fit with, like Emily said, the tone of the collection. Um, I'm always encouraging folks to do uh, purchase suggestions at their libraries because that shows us that you are really invested in seeing that title on our shelves and seeing that it's made available for the rest of the community. Um, so at, for us at Crook County Library, we have a little more flexibility with ordering because we are small, so we can track down um, some different titles that maybe don't come through large vendors. Uh, and, you know, by and large, I would say we're probably filling 95% of suggestion for purchases. The ones we don't fill are generally the older titles, the ones that we would use through other resource sharing methods like interlibrary loan. Yeah, I just was going to touch on that really fast, April. I'm glad you mentioned interlibrary loan, um, because even if something doesn't necessarily fit a collection development policy back to your intellectual freedom rights, you do have rights to information, even if the library has chosen not to buy that specific title for their inclusion in their collection. And so, you know, for us with those purchase suggestions, if it doesn't fit the curation of our library. Um, an interlibrary loan is an awesome option so that you still have access to that information, even if we haven't decided to purchase a specific copy for our collection. Yeah, and tapping with that, I mean, it's exactly what is happening in my district. It's like by hiring me and not just me because it's me is because it, the district librarian I'm, I'm the only certified librarian in the district and what the district wants to do is is have a more um a, a way to follow the the idea for example that opening up all the the catalog to all the schools so we are so we can see how many books we have in different so it's like a way i mean just a couple of days ago, uh, somebody was asking for for holes that because they need to have it for. So between all of us, we're like, okay, who has it? So we were like looking and and, but that only happened if we have an open uh, service to so we can serve all the students. And we, uh, our pillars, we have a collection development policy that, but that is based in the two main pillars of that are the our mission statement, the Redmond School District statement, and the administrative rule that I have here that was last time review and is very long, but is is the is called instructional material selection. So based on that rule that the last time that was uh, revised and reviewed by the board was in, in August 24th. That is the one that we uh, we based our um, 
collection development policy, which is, is kind of like a, a, the has three parties, the selection, then is the, the kind of weeding, and then is the curation of, of the collection. And, uh, and we ba it's basically, the, it's, it's in the, I mean, uh, the has to be aligned with the curriculum, which is super important, that has to be fit with the needs and the, and the, um, and the how do you call it, the interest of our students. So you need to know your, your audience, you need to know, know your users uh, very well. And, um, and also that there is important subject matter that, that tap, I mean, and, and that is the variety that represent uh, each of our students. Um, and then um, the other one is the, the quality, the production that is a publisher that is reliable. Ta a price is super important because we don't, we have very limited uh, amount. Of, so the, when we, um, or when, when I construct the list, I mean, when I, is, I have tons of wish lists, but it takes me sometimes months to build one. And one of the requirements is that at least has one review in a reputable uh, a journal or a, a library journal, or could be from the National Council of Teacher of English or ISTE. So, so it's not, and also social media has a lot of uh, educators that share the information, librarians, but still they share it, but still I have to check what they're sharing. And, and we, we use a tool that is, that is I mean, we use uh, Destiny by Follett and they have a super useful uh, tool, which is called Title Wave, where you can look at all the reviews of the, the reading level, the interest level, the and so many times I will I get all excited about a book and then I read it and it's like mm, I guess the reviews are not very good or or they're not for my kids maybe for a public library so it goes to a lot of uh, revision so it's not like the first one that show up in Google no. <laughs> Yes, very well put. Thank you. So you've spoken about how each individual library system kind of curates, but what if, what do you think, is there any kind of national standard that specifies or suggests which books, if any, should be banned? And if such a system existed, would your libraries be uh, obligated to comply? What a great question. Um, so as far as a national standard of like ban these books, that, that doesn't exist. Um, there are guiding principles from our uh, parent organization, the American Library Association. Um, so the, their guiding principles, the first one is called the Library Bill of Rights. And the Library Bill of Rights in uh, really outlines what it means to uphold your First Amendment rights to use a library. So it talks about um, having, you know, anti-censorship policies and doctrines, which we just talked about a lot of that is included in a collection development policy. It also goes into things like patron privacy or your access to meeting rooms. So there's a lot to intellectual freedom. Today we're focused pretty exclusively on books, but it is a lot of different access points at a library. Um, beyond that, they also have two statements called the freedom to read and the freedom to view. And those really go into specific details of what are your rights to view an item and specifically DVDs and movies when those became popular for libraries. And what are your rights for reading materials? And it there's um, that document is a bit longer, but there's really interesting sound bites in there, things along the lines of we believe that um, Americans would choose to have open access to materials over a protected worldview, for example. And so really saying we, we believe in keeping access as open as possible because our customers and our patrons should have the right to curate 
their information need. Um, so that would be the level of standard that we would look at. And then again, um, guiding principles to have policies in place that uphold those documents. And yes, uh, Deschutes Public Library does follow those. And there is, um, you know, it's not a national standard, but there are reports every year of the top 10 most banned and challenged books based on the data that's collected by um, the ALA's Intellectual Freedom Committee. And, you know, it's um, a list that every public library looks at every year just to see kind of what made it um, and the reasoning behind that. And that is always a great opportunity to reflect on what items are in our collection that may have made that year's list, what items aren't in our collection. Um, and it's always just a good opportunity to reconsider, you know, the decisions that may or may not have been made about some of those items. So while it's not a national standard, um, there's definitely, I guess I would call it a time for reflection every year um, on, on trends and bans and challenges. So I mean, I'm listening to your answers. I, I need to I need to hear again the question because I was like maybe I I went lost. Or... Yes. So Pia, the question is: uh, Is there any kind of national standard that says that some books need to be banned? Oh. And and you might have a different answer for the other countries that you have lived in. And then uh, the follow-up question is, if there was a standard that said these books must be banned, must be taken away, would these libraries here, would your library have to follow it? Well, my, my experience, I mean, I, I have lived in, in the United States, in Chile, where I'm originally from, and, um, and Spain. And, um, and in Chile, I, I can talk when I was a student, not, not when I, I, because I was not, I, I came to, I, I study in, the United, in, in Chile and the United States. When I went to college, I, I left the United States in 20, when I was 27 years old. So for me, um, was more like they banned us to read certain, I mean, we were under a, a dictatorship. And um, so, I mean, completely like communism is the worst thing in the world, which I mean, I, I'm not communist and nothing like that. But I think if you want to say that, you need to know what they, are, what it, what they stand for. So I remember kind of a little bit talking with professors and saying, well, but we need to read the, the sources if we are going to uh, blame them for something. And we couldn't. I mean, it was part of the university that we didn't. And I mean, I always say, if you, you need to know if, 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 what are the values that are being challenged in order to confront your own values and see if like, yeah, no, I don't agree with that. I mean, I need to know that. So for me, that was something that uh, we didn't have. And I think that is, is something that is super detrimental for any society because you, you don't have access to, to, to disagree. I mean, and you don't have a, the, the power, you cannot disagree. You have to follow through and you have to kind of like say, okay, but without conviction. And, and I think that is the, the beauty of democracy, that in a democracy, the minority or the one that is not going you know, win the election or whatever, uh, has a, a say also. And the representative, the, the people that we elect, they need to hear them also they need to hear all the voices, not just one or the one that is the mainstream or the one that is convenient, but everyone. And, and that is what the uh, so in, in, in my case, and in, in Spain is completely the opposite. I mean, Spain is super open in terms of the sexuality. I mean, sometimes I was like, oh my gosh, look at the, the gift that they give each other, I was kind of surprised. But super open, super open with everything, with 
um, the way with drinking, with with the uh, sex, with so that that banning books and also they're super expensive. So it's kind of like why we bought this book and now we're going to ban it. So so it's like we in, in Chile and in Spain they're super. Uh, we they appreciate books a lot. I mean it's is they're super super valued and um, so but they also go through a uh, collection development and in libraries i mean it's not like that that they put whatever is it's, it's the same thing that in the united states that they follow some rules some it's more like when the government start uh, or 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 uh, somebody start kind of being the guide of um, Kind of saying what is good to read and what is not good to read is when when it start to get kind of dangerous because it's, you always exclude somebody. I mean, we wouldn't have any book in our libraries if we start kind of uh, putting aside all the books that somebody doesn't agree with them because somebody doesn't agree, the other person will say, "I want this book back." So. Absolutely, Pia. You put that very well. So let's go down a thought experiment. What if we did start banning the books, taking them off the shelves when somebody said, I don't agree with what is in this book? Where would we put those books? Where do libraries in general put banned books? Does anyone know of, for instance, if one could get special access to these books after they're banned? And I can't help but think of Harry Potter and the restricted section, for instance. So does anyone have any experience or any uh, ideas about where these books would go if we were to remove them from the public shelves? Uh, yeah, I love these questions. They're so good. Um, you know, the, for, for, for me with intellectual freedom and when we look at what the courts have held, um, I turn often back to what is hold to us legally that we are allowed to do and not allowed to do. And I need to start by saying I'm not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. Anytime you talk about the law, you have to set that doctrine. But, you know, the law has been very clear with us on what we can and cannot do as far as restricting access based off of content. And I'm a bit of a purist on that. And so for me, I won't make a content related restriction if it if the item fits our collection development policy. So I always go back to, does the item fit our collection development policy? If it does, it stays. If it doesn't, it goes. And that's going to be an objective standard, um, regardless of the content of the item. So for us at Deschutes, I, I can't imagine a scenario where we would ban, like the traditional you know, definition of banning, where we are removing it because of the content of the material. That said, I do know um, that some libraries have investigated that idea of, well, we don't want to get rid of it entirely, but we want to set some parameters around use. And again, for me, what it comes down to is that you are given your right to information at birth. Um, it's not something that you age into. It's not something that, oh, magically at age 21, now you have your right to your own intellect. And so really those decisions as far as restriction for access for me fall under um, the umbrella of the parent. And so I wouldn't feel comfortable removing access to materials um, on that level and putting them away on a restricted section. Um, I, again, some libraries have investigated that avenue. What I will say is that when libraries have not gone that route, it's often been, again, for an objective standard. So, for example, um, you know, Dr. Seuss, and I don't want to go into too many details, but Dr. Seuss had six titles that the, the um, organization that manages his publications decided they no longer wanted to print. And immediately overnight, those books became immensely valuable. And so public libraries would make the choice to actually protect that content, to protect future access to that title, 
they would be put in library use only just because people were stealing them and selling them on eBay. So those would be some objective standards that you can set to say, I want to actually protect this content and in protecting it, I'm setting it to library use only. That would be a scenario where change the access um, for an objective reason. Yeah, I don't know if I have anything to add to that necessarily, but I do see uh, another question in here about appropriateness, which is a word that we've been using quite a bit here and what appropriate <laughs> as a word may do to tie in um, to access to collections. And as somebody who in the past year has been asked to set aside collections that are restricted in one way or another, um, I and my staff did a lot of work into, into looking into that and what does that mean and how does something that one, so this is primarily in the youth section as well, um, you know, an item that one member of the community may feel is inappropriate for children, moving that to a restricted shelf, well then that's an individual decision that has an impact on the entire body of library users. So when Emily says you know, it's kind of in or out, <laughs> I, I agree that that's how it has to be because otherwise if you're making these intermediary areas, you're taking that one perspective of what's appropriate and what's not and applying that to everyone else in the community. Um, and then that, that just doesn't really work. Um, you know, thinking about that list of banned books that comes out every year, banned or challenged. Um, you know, you may see a library do a display around banned books week where we kind of on the side to highlight them, but that's not the same as a permanent um, special collection or a permanent restricted collection. Um, again, I do think that in this situation, public libraries exist in a sphere where that guiding principle of intellectual freedom is just in everything that we do. It could be different in a school. Um, it could be different in a private collection or a privately funded collection where the, um, the mission is completely different. Um, but yeah, it's, that's just kind of what I was thinking to tie in this idea of appropriateness is that one person's appropriate is another person's inappropriate. One person's book that should be restricted is another person's key text to how they live their life. Yeah, and also to add into that, I would say that is a, a, is a choice. I mean, it's not like, a, I mean, in, in a school library, I mean, we are not forcing students to read certain, certain type of books. It's more like their choice to read whatever they want to read. I mean, we even when the teacher say you need to read, or we say, okay, get the one that your teacher wants, but also open up and or do read what you want to read. I mean, something that they, they choose. So it's, it's a free, so, and I, I don't have experience in terms of where they put those bad books. But the one thing that I would say to any parent is like, I read this, the writer's library from that, that was, they interview a, a bunch of writers, is Nancy Pearl and Jeff Schwager. And I listen it to the, Thank you to the public library, the Shoot Public Library. I listened to it. And when I listened to it, I was like, I need to get this book because it's amazing. I mean, all the books that they mentioned. And I was so impressed about the idea that what they say, all of them is like when they grew up, they have access to books. I mean, they read anything that was in their hands. I mean, the parents' book, all sort of books. So, and they became these amazing writers. So I think that the, uh, the having books available to our, our children, I mean, as a parent, have conversation with them. And if uh, an issue arrives, just uh, uh, talk about it. And, and, and actually sometimes the book can bring the issue that you will never talk in kind of a formal way, because your 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 child is going to run away. I mean, I have my daughter that she was reading at super high level, 
in, in seventh grade. And, I, and the teacher was saying, okay, she needs to read the like, sign level, whatever. And my daughter was, I refused to read Moby Dick because it was the only one that was kind of higher level. You know, I don't want to read about an old man uh, and a whale. So I was like, so I was looking and looking. And finally, I found one in the high school library that was about friendship and friends and all the things that she was dealing with when seventh grade. So I was like, perfect. So I was very high level, like 1200 or something. So I gave it to her and of course she read it in two seconds. And the next or two days later, she, she gave it to me and she was like, mom, did you know that the, the, the protagonist uh, had an abortion? And I was like, no, I didn't. But then we had a conversation. So it was the only way that, I mean, the book, I thank the book because I'm from that day on and always she has a super open conversation with me and we bike together, we do tons of stuff together. And, 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 and I, I think that books have uh, been part of that opening and uh, um, uh, helpers. Yeah, I love your example. And I and I just wanted to share another one because it just is like all of the different ways to look at appropriateness. And so for example, my own personal example, I am, I am not a strong reader. I never have been. Um, and as a child, I was actually a very hesitant reader. I really, this was not a direction I wanted to go. This is not something I wanted to spend my time in. But I did love horror movies. And so my mom said that if I read the book, I could watch the movie. And so I started reading nothing but Stephen King. Absolutely, probably for many parents, inappropriate. But yeah. for me, it was exactly what I needed to actually learn to love to read. And that's one of those examples where it's like, it is going to be unique to every parent. It's going to be unique to every child. It's going to be unique to every situation. And I can't in my own right, tell a child they can't have access to something that ultimately makes them fall in love with reading and maybe even become a librarian, you never know. <laughs> Absolutely, Pia, I love what you said there about how books are gateways to conversations. And Emily, I am the biggest chicken in the world. So the idea of not only being forced to read a horror book, but then to watch the movie sounds awful to me. I, I, yeah. I love that example from you. So thank you for sharing that story because uh, it's it's so in line and, and I can just see that, that happening so well. So as Pia kind of helped lead us into the next question, lots of the books that are commonly banned or challenged do have subject materials that many people say are inappropriate, that's why they become banned. So when you as librarians see that top 10 banned books list for the year, are you more inclined to order those books? Are you less inclined to order those books or are you neutral? Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we, we try and be a popular lending library, which means that if they've made it to the top 10, they're probably already popular, right? Like there's been news about them. There's been press about them. There's been curious readers in our community that have asked us to buy them. And so most of the time I would say we already have them. Um, if we don't have them, it, it is something that is worth considering because it means that um, there was a valuable title that had valuable concepts that we don't have access to. So under the umbrella of you know, keeping things open and keeping conversations going and preserving the you know, content that is being challenged, it's it definitely opens my eyes to something I want to take another look at. But I can say in my career, I don't think that there's been a book on the challenge books that the library didn't already have. Yeah, I mean, that's been my experience as well, working with both a larger system and now in a smaller system. Um, these books got the attention. They, most of them have been reviewed by library publications. Um, so 
I can think of just a few years since I've been a librarian where something's been on that list and I haven't known about it. And that was earlier on um, before the internet became such a big part <laughs> of our lives. Um, so now because information sharing has just grown by such leaps and bounds with technology. Um, yeah, those books aren't like little hidden secrets. Um, they're, they're books that are out there that you find at the bookstore, you find them at Costco, you find them at your library. Um, so for, for a public library, I think, you know, unless you're a severely restricted budget, um, those books are going to be pretty familiar and likely to already be on the shelves. In my case, since I am in a severely budget, yeah. <laughs> I will say to the kids, go to the public library that has all those books. No. And, and also I think, um, I, I take into consideration my, I mean, there are so many good books that you can put that deals with the same topics or the same, that I, sometimes I have the inclination to say, I'm going to look at this other one also, and maybe put that in the, in the, in the library, instead, instead of like buying one that is already it has got a lot of detention and, um, and also because I have a very limited budget. And sometimes there are some books that maybe my community is not ready for. So I can go baby steps. I can go with another one and then uh, until they, they, they might be cool with it. <laughs> the art <laughs> of they will have to bring those <laughs> books in the library, which is, is, is would be amazing. I mean, I think that that is the best way of is uh, to the community kind of like help us uh, in saying we need those books uh, in, I mean, especially in school libraries that is, is, uh, is like the parents can request those that because it's, it kind of seems that it's like the right of some parents but not all the parents to request uh, not the removal, but the the addition of books. It would be nice if they, instead of being a negative thing, would be the other way, like, we want more books in your library. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, April, did you have something to add to that? I did not. Okay. So I, here's a, a question um, that I'm very eager to, to hear the answer. Do you think there are valid reasons to ban or to challenge a book? Do you think there are valid reasons to challenge or ban a book? Man, so I'm gonna try and answer this with as little legal talk as possible. But again, my, my guiding principles are what the courts have told us. So I believe that restrictions should be governed to us by law um, based off of the First Amendment and the subsequent court rulings. So there have been a few things that the courts have said don't follow under First Amendment. Um, the first is called the Miller test, which is really the most important, I think, to libraries. And it's, it's ultimately the legal definition of what is obscenity. And that Miller test says that you have to apply contemporary community standards, which basically means the entire community that you're in would agree based off of their standards that the entire work as a whole is indecent. And largely the second factor is that it's specifically sexual content. And the third is that it has in, out of the entire work, out of the entire whole of it, lacks any literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. And those are and statements. So if, if the item falls under all of those standards, then you could guess that maybe if it went in front of the court of law, it would fall under what they define as obscenity, and then we would remove it. But it would have to meet, you know, meet all of those legal standards, go through a court, and be deemed obscene, and then it would typically follow, fall off of a library shelf, which um, I can't name a title that that has ever been the case. 
So that's a very, very difficult standard to meet. But for me, that those would be my guiding principles. Well, and I think as far as intellectual freedom goes, part of your ability to access what you want is the ability to also challenge what you want. So while a ban and actual removal and that permanent restriction can be held to those legal standards, um, sure, challenge a book. Um, fill out the suggestion for purchase form. You know, let us know how you feel about an item that you feel is inappropriate or controversial. Um, that is your right as a library user. That feedback is incredibly important to us. Those conversations are really important to us. Um, so, you know, just kind of seeing the difference between I want to talk about this, I'd like to hear why this book is in my library versus, um, yeah, like legally this needs to be removed from the collection for, um, for a book ban. Yeah, in, in my case, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I, I would like to hear from parents. I mean, that they, they come, they visit me, they, we have a conversation of why, why they feel that needs to be banned or needs to be challenged. And also, I mean, parents, they need to understand also that they can restrict the access to their own child, um, the book, but not to the other children, because there is another parent that is going to come to me and say, why my children cannot read this book? So uh, that is one thing. And, uh, and the other one is like, we already go through a lot of I mean, we have a collection development policy that we have to align with. Uh, we listen to also suggestions from the faculty. We listen to the interest of the students. We listen to, so, and also the, the books that are published, if it's a reputable uh, uh, publisher, they go also through a lot of steps to the point to get to the access, uh, to get in the hands of the public. So, so all those things are already um, telling us that very few books, I mean, and, and the poor quality books, libraries are not going to choose that. I mean, they're not going to be there or they self-publish. We might find one self-published book, but we probably will have a bunch of people at the library has to read it before we, 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 ask, we, we, we get it for the, our collection. So there are a lot of things in place, procedures that, uh, and, and parents are super welcome to, to come and visit us and see the libraries. I, 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 my dream is that to have kind of like a, that is a community library. I mean, the school libraries should be part of the kind of a, a book club of parents and kids. And I mean, that would be, or anything, or playing music, or showing the talents of their kids in the library is super amazing. So. Yeah, I, I wanted to just touch on what April said about the conversation when a challenge happens. I, it, yes, absolutely, you have every right to to say I found the thing that is not of my worldview, and I want to verbalize that. And even that conversation is valuable to the library because we know yeah. what is of interest to our community and we get to know what the tone of, you know, our, our interests are and, and what we can do better in the next time. Um, but also it's a great conversational point with, with our customers and say like, you know, I understand that you found this thing that doesn't fit within your worldview, let me explain to you why it exists here and let me find something that better fits your needs. And typically those situations, those conversations are a great learning point for our customers as well. So um, yeah, just wanted to add to that. So Emily, thank you. That's a great point. Have any of you experienced though an op a chant a an instance where community members did not follow the protocol set in place to protect, you know, books from being arbitrarily removed from the shelves, and they kind of took matters into their own hands. Uh, yeah, I mean, that does happen. Um, 
Uh, not at this library. I have a fun, air quotes, fun um, example, but I, one of my previous institutions, I was, you know, doing just some standard weeding practices, and we came across a novel where a customer had um, used whiteout to remove every word that they found vulgar. Um, and they had actually done it in the full series. So we ended up having to go back and, and buy, you know, the series again, because the book had been, you know, essentially damaged in this interesting way. Um, so that, you know, is, is one example. I also know, you know, we've seen other tactics that have been taken to, to try and remove materials from the library. Um, what maybe those customers don't understand or are unaware of is that we have a lot of different reports and statistics and practices in place to help us know what is the status of the items on our shelf. So let's say an item is missing for too long or has we're not able to locate it on the shelf. We can go back and look at those items and look at those lists and see if uh, materials were of interest to the community at large based off of circulation statistics, again, reviews, recency of purchase, and it's an opportunity us for, for us to rebuy those items. So yes, customers do do that at times, um, but the tactic is unsuccessful in the long run. Yeah, in a smaller library, it's really important that we know our collection really well, just because the shelf space is so valuable. So we always have library aides, um, other folks from staff who are in the stacks. So we will find items, you know, if they've been purposely misshelved or if they have been um, kind of shoved back behind a shelf. Um, those items don't usually remain hidden for too long. Um, we did have an instance where we found an item that had been shoved behind the diaper changing table in one of our restrooms. Um, that item had been missing for a while. <laughs> uh, it was in that case, it was brand new. So we didn't have a lot of um, information in our system to help track it down once it had been missing. Um, we have seen items be thrown in the garbage um, that then because of the way our security system is set up, they're discovered um, when the garbage is taken out. So I think that in the moment, it can feel powerful for somebody to feel like they are taking matters into their own hands. Um, but in the end, there, there are so many tools and just our own knowledge of our collection that help us keep in touch with, with items that may have wandered off. No, I mean, in my case, I with, uh, I mean, since I arrived, uh, I, I have been back and forth in Central Oregon, and the last time I, I came here was 2019, and with my current team of librarians, library technicians, I haven't had a, 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 a problem, I mean, on the contrary, they're super great, the way they work, the they do their best in with all the things that they have to do during the day. But in other um, uh, schools, and I have a, the experience of like this, the, the librarian being the, the, the sensor and kind of like finding books behind. And one I remember was one of Christopher Columbus with the, when ar arriving to, the Americas and, and kind of like was a picture that was with Native American and they were half naked. So it was and probably because the kids went and just wanted to look at just that photo. And, I, and that is when it comes our role is kind of give them students the context. I mean, I of, of what is going on. I remember showing a, a video of Martin Luther King and they were saying that people shouldn't be discriminated uh, because of sex or, and all of the kids were like, oh, and I was like, okay, wait a minute. I think we have to talk here. I mean, because they were like completely missing, missing the, the context of the, of the video, of the, the work. So, so I think that that is also uh, something I, I remember also a student in high school, but this was a long time ago that, Came, was one book about sexuality 
and he was like, this book is disgusting. I mean, but he had, he, he told me, I mean, and then we, we talk about why he thought that it was not appropriate. I said, you need to remove it. But uh, this, but they, they, I, I never seen a student or because th those are my users mostly and or uh, no teachers that they're telling me you should, I mean, that they hide books or I, I haven't experienced that. So what book or material do you, would you in particular miss if it wasn't on your shelves anymore? Oh, um, so I mean, probably any of them, just because it would hurt me <laughs> to see the access gone. But I would say on, on my, on a personal level, um, mentioned in the bio that my favorite band book is Harry Potter which, you know, the, it's the entire series of Harry Potter has been challenged over many, many years. And um, yeah, it's just a story that I find very touching. I find it very comforting. It's, you know, a book I turn to when I don't have anything else that I want to read. Um, and it's just, yeah, there's something about those particular books that take you away into another world. And and, and it's beautiful and exciting. And I just, I would be really sad if the world didn't have Harry Potter. Thinking about this question, for me, it's those books that, um, that expanded my worldview as far as historical events. Mm -hmm. um, when I was on the Prince Award Committee and you were able to award Out of Darkness um, with one of the honors that year. Um, you know, it stands on its own as a tremendous piece of literature. But for me, if if I hadn't read that, I wouldn't have known about this horrific um, explosion that took out a school in South Texas in 1930s um, and killed 300 people. And then I wouldn't have known about the pre-segregation racial tensions that existed between all the people living in Texas at that time. Um, it really just opened my mind to a part of American history that I didn't learn about in school. Um, so I also think about like the graphic novel Persepolis about the Iranian revolution and that book is frequently challenged and that one um, like just knocked my socks off the first time I read it. And I was like, how have I gotten to this point in my adult life? Because I think I was, I don't remember the year it came out, but I believe I was in college or later. It's like, how, how have I gotten this far in my life and never really understood the mechanics of the Iranian revolution? Um, and so it led me to learn more about that. And I then was a more educated adult. Um, so it's those titles in particular that I would really miss that that get us out of some of our um, standardized learning and and get us into some new new ideas and more education. For me, it's, it's, it's also the historical books. I mean, and, and not I mean, having different perspective of a history books. I mean, like Emily said, I would be sad if they remove any of the books in the library that uh, that we have chosen with so much care, but the uh, different uh, uh, historical perspective, I think is so important. I mean, I, I my undergraduate degree and uh, teaching certification is, 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 a, is in history. And I did a master in Chilean history. And then I came to the United States with a Fulbright scholarship to do a master degree in history again. So it's reading, I mean, putting in the, in the shoes of other, and also like one of the professor was uh, always uh, told us, is like history is not to be uh, uh, sitting in the past, it's more to project to the future, to see how our societies have been working and how we can uh, be prepared and be a better society in uh, and 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 bring all those issues to the present and see how we can be, become better. So so not I learn from our mistake that is the typical thing that they say. But I think that bringing different perspective enrich so much our culture and also reading not just uh, from 
one country, but from several countries, and I mean, from the world is an open up so many, so many opportunities. And, uh, and you learn, I mean, and, and also uh, dismantle fear because you, you read about or about people in, in the Middle East that you are like, wow, I didn't, I mean, and, and, and maybe that you have a prejudice or you have some, some thoughts about now, I, 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 I cannot uh, agree with uh, that type of a uh, uh, way of living or something, but if you learn about it, you can. So I would be really sad uh, if they take away different perspectives, especially when they are written by, in it, like for example, in this country, in the United States, uh, by like uh, the perspective of a Native American, the history through the, the perspective of Native American or the perspective of slavery or like Stamp, for example, that is a scholar, it's a scholar book and super important to read it. And, and, and it, Jason Reynolds book, I mean, and he, I mean, listening to it is amazing. And also having a conversation because it's a starting point that you can tell your students. I mean, if I were in the classroom teaching history, you're like, okay, let's confront what he's saying with primary sources, with facts. Let's see why he's saying it and why he's understanding this issue, this form and not the other one. So it it's, would be sad and dull, I guess, not to have them. It would be sad and dull. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Whether it is introducing us to parts of our world that we didn't understand the history, that we didn't have the chance to learn because it's not perhaps the majority history that we're introduced to, or whether it's completely new, fantastic worlds that would never have existed unless we had this author's mind. I think you all put it very well that the library and the world would be a very sad, dull place without some of these books. So our final question for the night, and it's a big one. Uh, what do you all think the general public can do to support intellectual freedom in their community? Oh, um, I mean, being here is part of it, right? So I think one of the things that I notice a lot is that our community doesn't understand why the library has what it has. Um, so they find a book that doesn't fit their worldview and they feel deeply upset about that and they challenge it. But the again, and, and April mentioned this beautifully earlier, it's that conversation as to the why, right? Like it, what are what is the purpose? What are we trying to protect? Um, that I think leads to a, a joint understanding that maybe leaves you open to the perspectives of others. So if we could help our world know why, you know, why intellectual freedoms mat matters as far as like your right to information shouldn't be hindered. So therefore, why should the right of in to information be hindered to another? Then it maybe creates a little bit more compassion and capacity for different ideas outside of your worldview. And then maybe even beyond that, you start to question, maybe I'm, maybe I'm interested in reading what's in that book. Maybe I'm interested in learning that perspective from my neighbor or my community that didn't necessarily fit my worldview, but like now I've created a curiosity. Um, and now maybe we can have a conversation, right? And now maybe we can start to bridge those gaps. And so, I think my ultimate hope for our community is that we understand intellectual freedom so that we are protecting that right, both for ourselves, but also for our neighbors. Um, and I think that would just change our community for the better in, in so many different ways. Yeah, I really encourage library users um, to make your thoughts known. Um, you know, there's 
the books and then there's the people behind the books and it we have venues for you to express feedback you know in my library you've got a good old-fashioned suggestion box right out there by our new, new items um, that gets checked every day <laughs> so you're not just dropping your comments into a black hole so taking the uh, making the choice to be engaged with your library. Um, if you are a parent or a guardian or an adult who's got um, a kiddo in school, making the choice to be engaged, what, whatever that might look like for you. Um, being curious, I think is just for tonight that I keep coming back to over and over is just a little bit of that moment of like, what is my response here and why do I feel that way? Um, if you are, an intellectual freedom warrior. I think you can take your perspectives into all of the social interactions that you have in your world. As we move through different circles and encounter different people, if you hear somebody who's agitated about what they found in their library, um, but you have done some education of yourself and maybe you've been to this presentation and now you feel like you're able to say, hey, you know, I actually learned a little bit about what intellectual freedom means and what that means to me and you as community members with a public library, um, just taking a little time to speak out and to share um, your appreciation for what libraries and schools are doing for our users. Um, that always makes us feel good, <laughs> uh, especially when you know we may have a tough week where we feel like um, things may have not been going so well as far as um, intellectual freedom goes. So um, yeah, just taking the moment to, to share your perspective and to have those conversations and to keep the, the good word about intellectual freedom flowing through all aspects of our community, um, I think is really powerful. Yes, and, uh, and also I would, I would ask them, I mean, in any body, I mean, because now we live in a world that with social media, we get so much information and so many, I mean, vitriolic things sometimes, or kind of like that get our emotions, very, very strong emotions. I mean, when we see something, it's like, look at this, this has to be, we need to get this book out and whatever, when they see it, I mean, I would ask them first, to think about why they, they're so upset with it. What, what is, I mean, the, to check a little bit their own emotion because sometimes social media is exactly that what they want you to. They want you to be outraged. They want you to be uh, unhappy or they, or they want you to be like, oh, you need to share it or that you shared something or like it. So, so kind of pause breathe 10 seconds or 10 times, I guess, and then then see and check where the information is coming from and see, uh, and, and, and if you're a parent, I mean, uh, come, I mean, I think that Emily and April were saying is the same thing in the, in the school libraries. I mean, having a conversation is, is, is super important. I mean, we respect all point of view. And, and we don't like people to feel uncomfortable. I mean, some things are going to be uncomfortable in books, but it's something that is, is to, to, so we, we learn how to, to deal with them, not with rage, but with kindness, with care, with, with uh, thinking about others, not only us and our own kids, but also, the other kids that live around us and the other adults that they live around us and that they might be facing challenging things that we don't know. Absolutely, Pia, very well said. And what a great way to bring to a close our conversation tonight. Thank you so much to April and Emily and Pia for sharing all of your expertise, all of your passion and dedication all of your intellect. We really appreciate you being here tonight and for taking so much time to talk with our community about such an important topic. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Everyone attended this evening.